In section 1.4, we're still going to be taking a look at limits, but rather than taking limits graphically like maybe you would in this picture at the top of this slide, um, now we're going to be taking a look at taking limits analytically. That is to say, by just taking a look at the function that we're taking uh, the limit of, rather than a graph of that function. But luckily, the main idea behind a limit still applies. It's a y value that our graph is approaching as we approach a specific x value. Okay, so before we can get to some of the more complicated limits that we'll be taking, uh, we need to first set a bit of a foundation here of all the algebraic uh, properties of limits that we're going to need so we can apply those once we get to those um, more complicated limits. So this first basic limit that we're seeing here is what it's saying is that if we take the limit as x approaches some value called c, of a number that's equal to that same number. So as an example of that, if I tried to take the limit as x approaches 5 of the function 27, that would be equal to 27. Uh, I think in these first couple, I can somewhat illustrate what's going on here with a little bit of a graph and take this back to what we know from before this lesson. If we were to graph the function 27, it would just be a horizontal line. And if we approached 5, Visually, we take our left finger, put it to the left of 5, take our right finger, put it to the right of 5, and as we get closer and closer to 5, you'd notice we'd be approaching a y value. And that y value is 27 because we're still on this horizontal line, which is the graph of 27. So again, all these visual uh, limits that we took in the two previous lesson lessons still apply. It's just in a lot of these cases uh, in this particular lesson where it's going to either be too hard to graphically look at the limit or we might just not even have a graph of that limit. So luckily uh, in these basic ones the idea still applies uh, graphically like we saw in the last two lessons. So in this next limit if we take the limit as x approaches c of the function x, that's equal to c. That is to say, all we're doing is we're taking that value that x is approaching and plugging it, plug it in to the function for x. So as an example of that, if we were to take the limit as x approaches 5 of the function x, that would be equal to 5. Why? Well, just like back in our uh, algebra days when we evaluate functions at x values, we just took those x values and plugged them in. In this case, that's all we're doing. We're just taking that x value that we're approaching and plugging it in for x. In this case, as x approaches 5, um, we get a limit equal to 5. If we want to take the limit of uh, x to the n as x approaches c, again, you'll notice all we're doing is taking that value that x is approaching and plugging it in. In uh, again, these basic examples here, you can clearly see that the limit as x approaches 5 of x cubed is equal to 5 cubed. In this last basic example, you can see that as x approaches uh, c of the nth root of x, that's equal to the nth root of c. Again, that is to say, all we're doing is plugging in that value of 4x. So here if we take the limit as x approaches 5 of the cubic root of x, all we're going to end up with is the cubic root of 5. And again, to summarize these little basic ones, we could easily take these functions and graph them and do that graphical approach of finding the limit like you saw in the last two lessons. But here we're taking advantage of this uh, is more powerful a technique in that we don't need a graph and all we're doing here is just plugging in those x values. So as we take a look at some of the more complicated uh, limits that we're going to be doing, we need a little bit more uh, thorough set of properties to look at. So here in this first uh, property, you'll notice that we're trying to take the limit of some function f and that's being added or subtracted to some function g. You'll notice that the result of that is we've kind of split the limit into two limits. We take the limit of the f function separate from the g function, and then we add or subtract those depending on what symbol is in between those. So I think what you should take away from this is that what we're, what we're doing here is just splitting the one limit into two separate limits. But be very careful. It's very tempting to say that we distributed that limit. Um, the main reason that that's a problem to say that 
that is because there is no multiplication being implied when we write the limit of f of x or the limit of g of x. It's a math operation we're applying, so we really can't say that we're distributing that limit. Uh, what we're really doing is applying this property um, to a limit that lets us split it into two limits. Uh, again, we're going to use this quite a bit. In this next property, the product property, it's kind of like the summer difference from before, but here we're multiplying two functions and then taking the limit. Here we're taking the multiplication of f function and g function and trying to take that limit. Well, as it turns out, something that we can do to make this process a little simpler is take the limit of the f function on its own, take the limit of the g function on its own, and then we can multiply those two results to get an answer. Again, we're not distributing this limit, we're just applying this algebraic property to this limit. Uh, in another example, if we have a constant c, uh, it can be any number, if we have this constant c times a function, what we can do is take the limit of the function on its own and then multiply by that constant c. So I guess in this case, we can almost say that we factored out that c to the front of the limit. In this next example, we're going to take a look at the uh, quotient, a limit of a quotient, I should say. In this case, you can see that if we're taking the limit of a fraction, we can take the limit of the numerator of the fraction separate from the denominator of the fraction, and then we can divide those two results to get our answer. In this other uh, property that we're going to use from time to time, uh, here we're taking the limit of a function raised to a power. If it would help us take a limit, we could take and apply this algebraic property so that we can just take the limit of the function f and then raise it to the power of n. In this last example, I don't really want to call it the most important, but it's certainly one of the ones that could, let's say, throw you off from time to time if you didn't know when or how to use it. Uh, so I definitely pay careful attention to this one, as it's typically one of the ones that's easy to forget or just improperly apply. If we're taking the limit of a composite function, that is to say, there's a function g that's being put inside a function f, if we want to take that limit, what we can do is take the limit of the inside function, which we're calling g, and then we can apply the outside function, which we're calling f. I think this one, as opposed to some of these other ones, is going to be best illustrated in, a, in an example that we'll see in the next slide. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look at how we can apply those algebraic properties uh, to some certain limits uh, that we're given here. Uh, you'll notice before we even take a look at the limits we're uh, being asked to find, uh, what we need to do is at least appreciate what we're given here in terms of information. Uh, what they've given us here is the limit of the function f, g, and h as they all approach 1. And then they've given us the values uh, as the results, uh, 3, 2, and pi. What that is to really say is that if we were given that graph of f and looked as x approaches 1, we would see a y value of 3, for the g function we'd see a y value of 2, and for the h function we'd see a y value of pi. Unfortunately, we're not given the graphs, so we just kind of have to trust these values. Since we're given these values, um, maybe we can apply them to some of these other limits that we're going to be asked to find. So here in part A, we're being asked to find the limit as x approaches 1 of 5 times g of x. Well, unfortunately, we don't know what that's equal to. All we know is that the limit of just g is equal to 2. So what we can do and what we need to do is rewrite that limit so that we can apply that algebraic property. Here, we can take that 5 and, in a sense, factor it out to the front of the limit so that we're really just taking the limit of the function g. And you can see from above where I circled, we know that that limit is equal to 2. So we can just replace that whole thing right here with just the value of 2. And then, of course, we can just take the 5 and multiply by 2, which just gives us 10. So you can see that these algebraic properties are powerful in the sense that we can take a limit that's not obvious in terms of what it should be equal to, apply the property, and then it becomes fairly easy to see what it's equal to. In this next example, you can see that we want to take the limit as x approaches 1 of the function f plus the function g. Well, from that previous slide, we had a sum difference rule that allowed us to take the limit of the f function separate from the g function 
and then we can apply that math operation of addition. So here in this case, we can see that the limit of f of x is given to us as 3. We can see that the limit of g, which we used in part a a moment ago, was equal to 2. So if we just take those two values and replace them in our equation here, we can just simply add the 3 plus 2, which gives us 5 for that limit. And again, we're being able to do all of this without even looking at a graph or heck, even plugging in any numbers. Um, we're just taking what they're giving us and applying those algebra properties to figure out the result. In part C, we have a uh, product here inside of a limit. And anytime we have the product of two different functions inside of a limit, we can take that limit and split it into two different limits. If we apply that algebraic property correctly, we can take the limit of f of x, take the limit of g of x, and then multiply those two results. And again, just like part b, all we're really doing is replacing that limit of f with 3, that limit of g with 2, since those uh, pieces of info were given, a, in, given to us. And then, of course, we can just apply that math of multiplication and get a value of 6. In part D, we're being asked to find the limit of the f function divided by the g function. And again, if you've been following the pattern of what's emerging here, we can basically take that limit and apply it to the two separate parts. Again, I hesitate uh, to say distribute because we're not really distributing. Uh, we're applying this algebraic property. So in this case, we need to take the limit of the f function, which is in the numerator, take the limit of the g function, which is in the denominator, and then we can divide those two results. And again, just like parts b and c, the limit of f is 3, the limit of g is 2, so that fraction becomes 3 over 2. In that last slide, there was one that I kind of put a little bit of emphasis on because it's the one that can either throw people off or possibly give you some problems in terms of the way you rewrite a limit, and that was that composite property. Here in this last example, we're being asked to find the limit of cosine of h of x. So this whole expression right here is what we're taking the limit of cosine h of x. But what we need to appreciate is that up at the top, we don't have the information to find the limit of cosine h of x. All we're given information for is the limit of just h of x. So what we need to uh, take away from the way this is written is that this is a composite function. We have a function h that's been put inside of another function, which is our cosine function. So if we apply that property from the last slide, what that really means is we need to take the limit of the inside function, which is called h, and then we can apply the cosine function to that result. And that's important that we take this step to rewrite it uh, so that we can properly take this limit. Uh, here in calculus, the way we write things and the way we um, express math needs to be, in some sense, a little more stricter than maybe some of your previous math classes. So please take note that we can't just really skip this step until we've written it so that we can properly take this limit. Uh, once you've kind of overcome that little hurdle of the notation and the proper way to write it, now it's actually pretty straightforward. We can clearly see that the limit of h of x from the information above is equal to pi. So we can replace that entire thing with just the value of pi. And then we can apply that outer function, so to speak, which was our cosine function, to that value. And if you're just quick with your unit circle knowledge here, we know that the cosine of pi is equal to negative 1. Okay, so in the last slide, we were taking limits, we were given some limits as kind of a start to taking those more complicated limits. We didn't know where those values came from, they were just given to us. Here we're now going to adjust our point of view to taking limits of functions where we're actually given the function. Unlike the last slide, where there was an f of x here, or a g of x, or an h of x, here we're actually given the function that we want to take the limit of. And the thing to kind of remind yourself about is we could take the time to graph x squared plus x. It wouldn't be quick necessarily, but it wouldn't be too hard. And then of course we could take our left finger, put it to the left of negative 2, take our right finger, put it to the right of negative 2, and try to find that y value as our answer for the limit. But if you notice something from that first slide from those basic limits, essentially what you can do when you're taking a limit is just take the x value in question and plug it in, just like you would if you were doing an algebra problem where you're trying to evaluate a function.
So what's set up here at the top is going to be the main way we're going to be taking limits. To evaluate a limit, what we're going to do is substitute the value directly into the function expression. So in this particular case, all we're going to do is take those x's and replace them with a negative 2. And again, a little note to make here from previous math classes is if you're plugging in a negative value, parentheses are going to be the key to making that work out um, with the arithmetic. If we compute that value, we're going to see that we have a limit of 2. So had we actually taken the time to graph this function and put our left finger to the left of negative 2, put our right finger to the right of negative 2, we would have saw a y value that we're approaching of 2. In this next example, as a good contrast to the first one, this would be a much more difficult task uh, to graph. Uh, certainly. Um, wouldn't be the hardest thing maybe ever, but it certainly would take a lot of time to get a good looking graph of this so we could take the limit graphically. Luckily, now that we have this idea of just evaluating our limit by substitution, it's a very easy process now. So what we need to do is take this x value of 4 that we're approaching and plug it into our expression. If we take the time to do that arithmetic, you will get a value of 13. Or again, that is to say, if we put our left finger to the left of 4, put our right finger to the right of 4 on the graph of this, we would be approaching a y value of 13. In this next example, we have another fraction, and again, it may or may not be easy to be graphed, but I think you can appreciate that really doesn't need to play a part. Now that we're armed with this idea of just plugging in this x value and seeing what we're getting as a result, um, we can go ahead and proceed with that idea. If we take the 2 and plug it in the top and the bottom, uh, we're going to end up with a very interesting result. Here we're going to end up with 0 in the numerator and 0 in the denominator. So I guess a good question to pose here would be, is that overall fraction equal to 0? Or maybe that overall fraction is undefined because of the 0 in the bottom. Really, 0 over 0 is going to introduce a little new vocabulary term that's going to be with us uh, throughout calculus. And that term is called an indeterminate form. Essentially, 0 over 0 is just a mathematically meaningless expression. That 0 over 0 could be a limit that exists or doesn't exist. The limits that produce an indeterminate form may or may not exist. So it's really not enough to say right now whether it's a DNE limit or whether the limit is equal to just some number. The other thing that we're going to have to take away from this is if you ever see this 0 over 0 limit, that just is going to indicate to you that we have to do more work to evaluate the limit. And realistically, with the majority, if not all of the limits you guys are going to see uh, with regard to 0 over 0, that's really just going to mean we need to simplify that rational expression. And if we take that even one more step further, you can see in this example, it's just going to be a matter of factoring the top. If we take a moment to factor the top, we end up with x plus 3 times x minus 2. And you can see that's a really helpful uh, factoring result because we have an x minus 2 in the top, we have an x minus 2 in the bottom, and as you know, you can reduce that to a 1, or you can simply say cancel them. Uh, one thing to note here, though, is to be careful with the way you write this. You'll notice we haven't taken a limit yet. So as you heard me say in a previous slide, notation is going to become very important in this course. So if we haven't taken the limit, we still need to write that limit notation in this step, since all we're doing is really factoring the top. So if we go ahead and cancel out those x minus 2s, we're still taking the limit here. So we need that limit notation, and we're really just taking the limit of x plus 3. And again, you can uh, appreciate what we've been doing in this slide. All that we need to do here is just plug in that value of 2 for x. So here we have 2 plus 3, which is equal to 5. So again, just to make sure that this idea of notation is really sinking in, uh, please take careful note of this little message that's right here. We need to keep writing the limit until we successfully substitute in the value so we can get our answer. Um, the little analogy I can give you to this is if we're taking the square root of a number, let's say 4, we would keep writing that square root symbol until we took the square root. Well, here in this case, we know the square root of 4 is 2, so that's when we stop writing that square root notation. Uh, look at the square root symbol as the notation that we're using here like a limit. It's a math operation that we need to keep writing until we actually do that math operation. 
Once we do that math operation, then we can stop writing that math operation. So again, we're definitely going to have to work on notation with a lot of these new math concepts you're going to learn here in calculus. Okay, so continuing on with this idea of evaluating limits by plugging in that x value, uh, let's take a look at a couple more examples. In this case, we want to take the limit as x approaches 3 of this rational expression. If we end up with 0 over 0, we know that's going to be more work. But in this case, we end up with 0 over 20. The first thing to note here is that is not an indeterminate form. You're going to see a lot of problems that end up as 0 over 0, and sometimes the mistake that's made is just to consider everything a 0 over 0 case. But here in this case, it's not 0 over 0, and we know that 0 divided by any number, as long as it's not another 0, is just equal to 0. So as the title of this slide implies, we need to, we need to know when 0 is not an indeterminate form. So if we don't get 0 over 0, it's going to be some other answer, and it's not going to be that indeterminate form. Here, it's just equal to 0. In this next example, we're going to take the limit as x approaches negative 1. So if we take the time to plug in negative 1 for x and compute that value, here we end up with 4 over 0. Again, we have to be very careful to not mistake this for an indeterminate form. It's only if we end up with 0 over 0. So then how do we record an answer of 4 over 0? Well, from previous math classes, you probably recorded an answer if you ever divided by 0 as undefined. And for now, that's what we're going to say about this limit, that this limit is undefined. But in the next lesson in chapter 1, section 1.5, we're going to understand how to take that answer of undefined and determine whether the limit is positive infinity, negative infinity, or D and E. But again, for now, uh, since we haven't covered that lesson, we're just going to say that this limit is undefined. So now with these two examples and what we saw on the last slide, we now have the three possibilities um, with uh, regard to what a limit could be equal to. The first one being 0 over 0, which is indeterminate, and that's just going to tell you you need to do more work. If we end up with 0 over something that's not 0, then we know that limit is equal to 0. If we end up with something that's not 0 divided by 0, at least just for now in this one lesson, where we're going to record that answer as being undefined. But again, in section 1.5, we'll be able to get a more precise answer once we see how to approach those undefined limits. So here we have one more example of uh, taking a limit analytically. Here we need to take that x value of 0 and plug it in. And you can quickly see that, of course, we're going to end up with 0 over 0. So I would always say the first step, always, always, is to not assume that you're going to end up with an indeterminate form. If you assume that, you might be setting yourself up for either doing the problem in a much harder manner, or it just might give you an entirely different, uh, different or wrong answer. So always use direct substitution first when evaluating a limit. And again here, you can clearly see uh, that it's just 0 over 0, which means to do more work. So let's try that technique we saw on that last slide. Um, if we can factor the top and or the bottom and then cancel a certain factor in the top or the bottom, that's definitely going to help us out in terms of simplifying this um, fraction. So here you'll notice in the top, both terms have a factor of x squared. And the bottom, both terms have a factor of x squared. So of course, we can factor out an x squared from the top and the bottom. Again, be very careful with the way you're writing out your steps in these problems. We haven't actually taken a limit yet, so we still need that limit notation. Once we see an x squared in the top and the bottom, and they are factors, which is important, we can then cancel those out. And now we just need to take the limit of whatever is left over. One more time. We still need that limit notation here because we actually haven't taken the limit. And what does the limit uh, taking process involve? Well, we just need to take that value of x and plug it in. And now you'll notice we don't need that limit notation because we're taking the limit by plugging in 0. Here, we'll end up with 8 over negative 16, which simplifies to negative 1 half. Okay, so in this last example, we're going to take our first attempt at looking at an AP test free response question. 
Uh, most of the questions you've seen up until now have just been multiple choice type questions. Whether I've actually put the multiple choice uh, answers there so you can see them, uh, most of these have been the multiple choice type questions. Now we're going to take a look at a piece of an AP test free response question. And here in this case, we have a function f that's given by this piecewise function. Uh, don't let the fact that it's piecewise throw you off. All it's saying is that if we know x is less than or equal to zero, we use this top function. If we know x is bigger than zero, we use the bottom function. So it's just two functions, and we're going to use each one depending on what x value we're looking at. So here in this case, uh, what they're telling us is we need to show that f is continuous. So in a sense, they're telling you the answer here. They're telling you that you know f is continuous, and we just need to show that it's continuous at x equals 0. Well, if you recall from the last lesson, um, we know how to show that a function is uh, continuous at a certain point, and it involves those three checks that we have to go through. The only thing different here with this problem, unlike what you've seen before, is before we had graphs to look at so that we could determine those three checks. Now we don't have a graph to look at. By the way, this is no calculator. So since we have no graph to look at, it's appropriate that we cover this example in this lesson because that means we're going to have to take these limits analytically. So before we do anything, luckily the first check in the three checks for continuity doesn't even, doesn't even involve a limit. All it involves is finding the value of the function at the x value in question. And again, we're trying to prove that the function is continuous at 0. So we need to determine, is f of 0 defined? Well, from what I said at the very beginning of this slide, we just need to know which of the two functions to use depending on the x value that we're using. Since we're trying to plug in 0, all we can use is this top function right here, since it lets us uh, have an x value that's equal to 0. If we plug in 0 into that top function, we'll end up with a value of 1. So all we know for now is that's a check. We know f of 0 is defined, and that value is equal to 1. The second check required that we took a limit. Does the limit of the function at 0 exist? Well, the interesting thing here is that we have a piecewise function. Since we have a piecewise function, we have to split this limit into a left limit and a right limit, because you can clearly see here to the left of 0, we can only use this function. To the right of 0, we can only use the second function. So we can't just take this limit overall in just one step. Here we have to split it into its two separate limits, and then we can determine are our left and right fingers coming together, or are the left and the right limits equal to each other. So again, notation is going to be very important here. What we're trying to show here for the left limit is that we're taking the limit from the left of zero. That little negative at the top of the zero is indicating our left limit. Well, the function that lets us b to the left of 0 is our top function. And again, we know from this lesson 1.4, if we want to take the limit at an x value, all we have to do is plug it in. And in this case, it's the same exact result like we saw from uh, the first check. We know that the left limit of our function f is equal to 1. So what about the right limit? Well, again, the notation is important to indicate which of these limits we're looking at. Here, we need that positive at the top of the zero to indicate that we're taking a right limit. Well, if we look at our piecewise function, the only function that lets us be to the right of zero is the second function. So here, we need to take that zero and plug it into the function we'll end up with e to the 0, and anything to the 0 power is equal to 1. So now what did we discover? If we actually had a graph of this, our left finger would be approaching a y value of 1, our right finger would be approaching a y value of 1, so now we can just take those two pieces of information and put them together. We know that since the left limit is equal to the right limit, we can say the overall limit of our function f is also equal to 1. So after we take all of that into account, now we can say that the second check works out. We know that the limit exists.
So if you keep in mind that idea back from continuity, that there might be this little floating dot idea either above or below our value, uh, we have one more check to ensure that this is truly a continuous function. And the last check is to verify, does the limit as x approaches 0 equal the function value at 0? And luckily, it's very easy to see. The first check gave us a value of 1. The second check gave us a value of 1. So we know those two values are equal. And now we can finally come to our final conclusion of what this problem wanted us to validate. Now that we see that all three of these checks worked out, now we can finalize this whole problem by simply saying that the function is continuous at x equals 0. So again, this was our first attempt at really looking at a true free response question or part of a free response question from the AP test. Okay, in this last slide, we're going to take a quick look at a very well-known uh, limit if you've seen a movie called Mean Girls. Uh, in this movie, the main character is at a math competition, and they give the two competitors uh, or the two teams uh, the, this limit to compute. So the uh, opposing team gets the question wrong, so the main character has a chance to answer correctly. So um, I guess how would this uh, character uh, in this movie answered this question? Well, the first thing they could have done, of course, is what we know from this lesson, and that is plug in zero to uh, evaluate the limit. Here you'd see that we end up with a zero over zero, which is just an indeterminate form, which based on what we've seen again in this lesson, just means to do more work. Well, <clears throat> in this case, there's really no amount of factoring or simplifying necessarily that we can do right away in a quick, easy way to kind of uh, cancel something out so we can take this limit, like the examples I've done. So realistically, this is probably a little bit of a movie magic in a sense, uh, because the character gets this question right by kind of remembering a lesson uh, that they saw their teacher talking about on infinite limits. So I guess as a way to prove why this limit does not exist, as the character correctly states when she answers the question, uh, we can take a look at a graph of this limit. Uh, if you graph this limit, uh, you end up with this uh, rough graph um, around uh, negative 1 to 1. And since we're taking this limit as x approaches 0, we can of course use our idea we saw in the first two lessons with putting our left finger to the left of 0, putting our right finger to the right of 0, and approaching uh, 0. As we get closer and closer to zero, the left finger is going up to positive infinity, the right finger is going down to uh, negative infinity. So as it turns out, the of course character was correct um, in this movie when she correctly stated that the limit does not exist.